from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Apple ramps up testing for its employees amid the rapid spread of COVID-19. Testing twice a week and even three times a week in some offices instead of just once. It's the latest company to tighten restrictions as Delta continues to take its toll. Plus, play to earn. Gamers are finding new ways to make money this summer thanks to NFTs. It's a far cry from mowing lawns. 776 founder Alexis Ohanian will talk about the new blockchain-based gaming boom. And the push for more environmentally friendly Bitcoin, a satellite network that will control many mining operations around the world and tap unused hydro and solar power. The CEO of Blockstream is with us. We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with our own Kriti Gupta and Kriti investors reacting to comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell about the pandemic having longer lasting economic effects. What did you see today? Absolutely. Growth concerns really dominating the market today, whether it's Chairman Powell, whether it's that retail sales data that come in, that came in short or even corporate earnings. We are seeing a risk off tone in the markets. Even big tech, that safe haven trade not doing so well down in line with those small caps, those economically sensitive stocks. But that wasn't the only story in the market today. I want to go over to those Chinese ADRs because you're starting to see even more pain, even more sliding when it comes to Chinese tech in particular. You can just see it in the chart behind me. That divergence getting bigger and bigger, but why? Yet new regulatory scrutiny, this time coming upon online competition. So you do have some draft rules aimed to target that piece, but also some of those kind of into entertainment stocks in particular, Chinese regulatory authorities trying to target idol culture. So from spiritual opium to idol culture, you are seeing this become a far more widespread crackdown than it already was. Now I want to go back to the U.S. though and talk about some of the subsectors in tech, because like I mentioned, it was a broadly risk off day unless you were a biotech investor that's really kind of the sector that's been doing super well here in light of those variant fears a lot of those vaccine makers doing extremely well so you can really see two percent gains for the nasdaq biotech index when even semiconductors which have been a popular trade on that global chip shortage and even bitcoin which has been making a comeback those in the red so nasdaq biotech that's the index you want to keep an eye on on a macro level for the micro let's get to ed ludlow yeah, Critty, on a risk off day, it was the mega cap tech stocks that really saw the brunt of losses. These are the biggest points decliners on the Nasdaq 100. Amazon, biggest drop in around three weeks. The stock trading at its lowest level since early June. Also looking at Tesla, continuing that streak of declines. Of course, we got the report from NHTSA that it's investigating Tesla's autopilot technology down 3%. NVIDIA also down significantly ahead of earnings on Wednesday, where we will get a good lens into the global semiconductor industry, as well as demand from crypto miners, because that's an area that NVIDIA has actually seen a boost from. But focusing back on Tesla, yes, a run of declines. If you take a step back and bring Tesla up side by side with the S&P 500 over a 12-month basis, one year, still vastly outperforming the broader index. You remember, it's actually down year to date, but the run up we saw in the shares over 2020, so significant. Finally, want to look at Walmart as well. Hovered flat for most of Tuesday. Investors couldn't mind, make their mind up about how they felt about the company's earnings. See a little movement over the course of Tuesday. Come with me quickly into my Bloomberg terminal. It's weakness in e-commerce. That growth that we saw because of the COVID pandemic has slowed right down to single digits. Where's all the benefit gone from the pandemic, Emily? Where's the e-commerce story for Walmart? All right, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later in the show. Not sure. Thank you so much. Meantime, as Kriti and Ed both mentioned, the surge in Delta variant cases continuing to weigh on market sentiment. I want to bring you up to date on the latest headlines. Here in the United States, authorities are planning to extend mask requirements for travelers on planes, trains, buses, and their respective terminals through mid-January. That's according to Reuters. Also, the U.S. government is set to offer booster shots as soon as next month. Morgan Stanley has joined the growing number of companies telling employees they must be vaccinated to enter its buildings. Meantime, Apple has done an about face on its decision to restart in-store classes due to the surge in cases. It's also going to be testing its employees more, a lot more. For more, I'm joined by Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman for all the details. So, Mark, what do we know? Apple going from testing once a week to twice or even three times a week for some employees. 
Yeah, that's right. First on the testing. So Apple since last year has offered a program where employees could test either at certain Apple offices, including Apple Park and Cupertino, or received at-home test kits from a company called Quest Diagnostics, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. You take the test, you mail it back over FedEx or UPS, and you get your results. That was a once a week effort. Now that's starting to be two times a week, this week and next. In the future, Apple's gonna start testing some employees in select offices up to three times a week for rapid tests. Uh, so that's an interesting change for a company that still is not requiring testing uh, per se or vaccines, but encouraging both. So let's talk then about the classes that they're offering in store. When you had reported that they were still planning to move forward with the return of these classes, um, you know, it was a little head scratching given that that you know, COVID seems to just be not going away. Um, what was it that caused them to change course? So yesterday morning, Apple sent out a memo to retail employees saying that these in store today at Apple classes, sort of learning how to use GarageBand, your phone and whatnot, would return beginning August 30th. Later in the day yesterday, Apple updated its website to allow customers to actually sign up for courses in cities like um, New York at the Soho stores, one I saw uh, yesterday. This morning, Apple sent out another memo uh, to employees in Canada, Brazil, the United States, and a few other regions indicating that this is no longer the case. They are postponing this. And if you go to Apple's website now, you can no longer sign up. Uh, this does remain an option starting August 30th in Europe uh, and some other regions, however. And look, Apple's not the only company changing plans. We've seen Facebook, Google, Amazon, Microsoft all um, changing their return to work strategies as Delta drags on. How much do you think these companies are taking cues from each other and cues from employees given that you know school's reopening? There's a lot of fear out there and it seems like this is going to be with us a lot longer than we thought. You're seeing a lot of consistency in how these tech companies are responding. You saw Apple delay their office plans from September to October. Now you've seen several other companies delay their office return plans as well. You saw Apple come out with the hybrid model and you're seeing Google and some other companies follow Apple with that hybrid model. So I think you're going to see a lot of consistency uh, across the board here. And in terms of people I'm talking to inside Apple, despite them saying there's not going to be a return until October, I think it's more likely to be February. All right, Mark Gurman, thanks so much for all those details. A story we will all continue to follow. Appreciate it. Thank Google, you. meantime, has released a new smartphone to woo budget-friendly users. At $449, the Pixel 5a costs $50 less than last year's 4a phone. Comes with a larger screen, a bigger battery, it's water resistant, the phone will be available in the United States and Japan later this month. Google hopes to claw back some of the market share it lost in the first half of the year, according to research from CounterPoint. Coming up, 776 founder and Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian joins us to discuss the NFT gaming boom. We'll have that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. Earn is the latest theme taking the gaming sector by storm. Axie Infinity, a video game which offers NFTs as rewards to players, has just surpassed $1 billion in sales. The game was developed by Vietnam gaming giant Sky Mavis, and it's based on an Ethereum-backed marketplace. For more, I want to bring in 776 founder, Reddit co-founder, Alexis Ohanian, who's also an investor in Axie Infinity, along with Mark Cuban. Uh, Alexis, all I can think is, oh, to be a team teenager these days, all these new ways to make money. You don't have to mow lawns anymore, do you? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And as someone who grew up playing video games, I can't help but feel a little bit jealous because uh, there are kids who are going to be making more money uh, than I was making at the Pizza Hut uh, from, from playing video games. And, and this is like, it's easy to joke about, but the reality is this play to earn model is going to become the new normal. And, and what it's doing to empower people all over the world is actually really remarkable uh, and, and, and quite extraordinary. So Axie Infinity has grown 750 times in one year. This convergence between blockchain and gaming and NFTs, explain to us what this all means. There are a lot of people who don't understand what's happening here. I get it. I get it. Uh, 
to put it in perspective, right, uh, the company did 200 million in revenue in July. They've already hit that number now halfway into August. Uh, this growth is remarkable. And, and the reason, well, look, there is a generation of gamers who have grown up, whether they're playing on their mobile phones or on their computers, they've grown up enjoying games, enjoying the community around games and spending lots of hard earned money on it. But they've never gotten to own the things that they spent the money on, right? You could, you could spend real money to get an in-game you know, skin in Fortnite to help you look cool or, or various things but you, you no longer owned it. It was just property of the game. What, what the blockchain does is create the technology so that you actually own the digital goods that you buy or earn. And what this does now that it is at scale and, and truly a global marketplace is it empowers gamers to, to really own the things that they're creating, to really actually monetize the time that they're spending playing these video games. And like I said, there's there's no putting this genie back in the bottle. Once people are realizing that this is an alternative, and in some cases, you know, you've got people who were forced out of work because of COVID, started playing Axie Infinity, are now making more money from this game, that they don't need to go back to work. They're paying their medical bills, they're feeding their families, and and it's a truly global phenomenon. And and yeah, if you you know consider this is the new normal for gaming, what reason would any person have to go back to spending their time playing games for free or spending money for things they don't actually own. So in the case of Axie, 95% of the money goes back to the players themselves, as I understand it. Talk to us about how you see blockchain and decentralization impacting other gaming giants. I'm thinking Epic. I'm thinking Activision Blizzard, Ubisoft, EA. Where is this going? You know, I, I gave a talk at Activision Blizzard about four years ago, and I was there just to talk about Reddit, but I couldn't help but plug <laughs> Ethereum and, and the potential for it. But I do think every one of these companies, you know, they weren't that interested back then. Uh, I think they're a lot more interested now, and I think broadly every one of these companies needs to have a strategy for how to use this new technology. Because a lot of them have the IP, they have the fan base, but very quickly you're seeing a new dynamic, right? The, the, the Axie, that community is 100% sort of player owned, that, that economy is 100% player owned. And so now you have someone who isn't just a fan of the game, but it's someone who benefits from that game being more successful, from telling their friends about it, from, from staying and being invested even more in it. This is the same sort of community driven system we saw help Reddit be so successful for the last 15 years, except now games are able to reward people for being an early believer, for being a community builder, for spending that time. And so, look, this is a, a paradigm shift of a technology. I don't use that phrase lightly, um, but it's gonna be important for all the incumbents to look at the new games that they're shipping and figure out ways to, to anchor it in this technology because it's proven it's working and the scale at which this is growing, I mean, this is, this is real money and, uh, and it's, it's already proving to be quite formidable. Meantime, Reddit just raised new funds at a $10 billion valuation. This has been a long journey. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't always looking that way. Talk to us about the power of community and the value of these platforms. Where do you see that going? Emily, I think I would like to take credit for having the foresight, um, uh, but I really, I didn't. Uh, we, we just thought, I, know, I, th I thought this was a good idea uh, to, to trust and sort of expect the power of community to scale sort of in the early premise of the internet. The thing that we did not anticipate that I, I think you're seeing now fulfilled through crypto is that sense of community ownership and, and the sense of being able to reward someone for being there early, for participating, and, and give them a sense of ownership that actually helps pay the bills, right? The, the fact that we now have programmable money that is creating this new sort of Web3 is, is a really, it's a big deal. And my expectation here going forward is that we're going to see a lot of really interesting stuff bubble up as more and more talented product developers, designers, engineers start building on blockchain tech. And, uh, and I really think this intersection of community and capital speaks to what this new internet is going to be. I think we, uh, in the first sort of Web 2.0, that movement of the last 15 years, uh, we, may, we got the, the community part right. We've seen that grow. We've seen that scale. The business models, however, were often at odds, right? Because there's an advertising model or sort of privacy was at risk. 
This new model is taking the best of community and then actually rewarding it through a system where everyone, everyone wins. Uh, and, and you're seeing it in NFTs, you're seeing it in a variety of different places now, but we're still in the earliest days and there's a lot more innovation to come. I, I think similar to what we saw when the, the app store first went online, we're gonna see uh, an explosion of creativity and, and ingenuity. And uh, it's gonna be really exciting to watch because I think it's gonna really finally give uh, sort of more value attributed to the people who create it, to the to the users, to the gamers, to the, the people who are actually doing the work. Meantime, you've got another famous community builder, Jack Dorsey, trying to build a decentralized social network. What do you think of his, no. his efforts? Do you think that's because he believes that community management can be a liability? I think, I think it's some very smart future proofing. And I think of it from a standpoint of we know we know that at the end of the day, content creators, community builders, they're driving the value of these networks. They're the reason people want to pay attention and retweet and like and all these other things. And, you know, we're seeing them now come sort of at odds with a lot of their original platforms. And I, I really think that it's incumbent on the existing social media networks to either figure out ways to adapt so that their business models make more sense for those creators or have someone else drink that milkshake. And I think the reality is, unless you're willing to go to the extent that Jack is to really try to decentralize yourself as an organization, I think you're gonna have a hard time. Uh, so I think now, he's, he is thinking along the right lines. At the same time, I, I recently spoke with the man known as the inventor of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, mm -hmm. about uh, Jack Dorsey's plans, Mark Zuckerberg's plans, and he thinks that the blockchain and Ethereum is really a threat to Facebook, to Twitter. Take a listen to a clip of what yeah. Vitalik had to say. Replacing the dollar completely is unlikely, um, just uh, because like there's things that the dollar provides, like uh, price stability, for example, that Bitcoin is uh, not going to provide. Like I think even in a theoretical world where um, the U.S. dollar collapses, like even then, I think uh, Bitcoin is not going to be able to provide the level of like stability that users and businesses expect to be able to set prices in. Um, and in that kind of world, like we, we would need something else. Like we, like it could be decentralized stable coins. It could be something else, but we'll see. Um, so, but at the same time, I think cryptocurrency can still have a very powerful and important role alongside uh, existing uh, currencies. So he goes on to say that you know he he's skeptical actually of some of Jack Dorsey's plans and that he thinks that you know the blockchain could really undermine um, the central centralized social networks that we've all come to know. What do you think? I do think long term, uh, Vitalik is probably right. And I'm sure there are people watching that clip who who are struggling to understand how this young man and maybe, you know, there's a whole lot of people behind this broader movement. But how, how what we're talking about here is potentially sort of reimagining the financial system. But the reality is, you know, we're talking about ones and zeros, we're talking about the power of software, and we're talking about something like, let's say, Ethereum, a blockchain that has now proven at a really impressive scale, I don't know what the current market cap is now, but, that, you know, at a really impressive scale that it works. And, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, this was one piece of the internet that was not was not sort of factored in, which is that sort of transfer of money. And, you know, a business like Stripe, for instance, has done a really good job being that fiat on-ramp into ones and zeros. But on the other side, you know, crypto has shown another way. And, and I do think that it's going to be the, the best bet that the incumbents have is to find ways to empower the, the real sort of value creators on the platform, which are the community and the content creators. Um, and at the, at what that means is, is beyond just points and hearts and all the other things, it's like, it's money. It's things that you can pay your rent right. on. And, and that's where the leverage is. That's, that was the final piece that has fit into the puzzle. And so uh, I do think it's a genuine threat. And user experience is still the thing that's going to make all the difference in the meantime. And so okay. the bigger question for me is when can these crypto technologies, when, when these blockchain technologies get to a good enough user experience at a large enough scale that it's meaningful enough for someone to bring their audience over. But All right. is it a question of if or when? I think it's just a question of when. Alexis Ohanian, 776 founder, thanks so much for sharing that perspective with us. I want this conversation to continue, um, Alexis. So thanks for joining us.
And you can catch my fascinating, it really was fascinating, conversation with Ethereum creator Vitalik Buterin on Studio 1.0, Wednesday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 p.m. here on the West Coast. All right, coming up, Walmart's e-commerce strategy in the spotlight. The latest earnings showing slowing online revenue. We'll talk about why. This is Bloomberg. The boom in pandemic-driven e-commerce seems to be fading for the world's biggest retailer. Walmart reported a deceleration in its online revenue and now hopes to claw back some of that during back-to-school season. For more, Bloomberg's Matt Townsend joins us now to discuss. So why did revenue online slow down? Isn't it supposed to be speeding up there, Matt? Yeah, well, I mean, they were going against really tough comparisons. I mean, their online sales doubled in the quarter a year ago. Um, so that's one excuse. I mean, maybe not the best excuse in the world. But also, yeah, that actually a lot of people are coming back into stores. I mean, if you look at Walmart's results, people coming into their stores and buying things are what really drove uh, their beat on uh, same-store sales. So can back-to-school make up for it? I mean, it definitely can. I mean, the, the company described uh, back-to-school so far, which basically starts in July, um, as strong. Um, and they've been impressed by, you know, how much uh, parents are buying, you know, backpacks and lunch boxes and clothing. Um, again, remember last year back to school was very muted because a lot of kids weren't going back to the classroom. So this is a sort of a, an additional boost to what is already a robust shopping season. Is this something that's going to reflect in other big retailers' online results as well? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing it uh, throughout retail. Um, you know, all these retailers had incredible growth last year. Um, now they're going up against the, those comparisons and the growth doesn't look as robust. Um, so, you know, we saw that with Home Depot, Target reports tomorrow. We'll see how they do. Um, but yeah, so a general slowing of growth. But again, the companies will say, look, look at what we've done over the past two years combined. You know, we're up over triple digits. So it's all point. It's all sort of where you look at the, the results. Right. All my kids needed to go back to school were pencils, so we're not going to help. <laughs> um, Bloomberg's Matt Townsend, thanks so much for joining us. Okay, coming up, Bitcoin and blockchain technology company Blockstream is getting a $5 million investment from Jack Dorsey Square. We're going to talk to CEO Adam Back about the future of sustainable crypto mining and how this might impact Bitcoin's price next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Jack Dorsey is on a mission to change how social networks operate and interact with one another. This week, Twitter announced that Blue Sky, the company's open source project, has just hired crypto developer Jay Graber, who said she's excited to take on the role and build the future of social media. With me now for more are Bloomberg tech reporter Kurt Wagner, who of course covers Twitter for us. So what exactly does this mean, Kurt? This is such a complicated um, idea and it's very idealistic, but imagine a world in which all of the posts that appear on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit, imagine that all of those are, are kind of available to any developer out there, right? And they can build an interface, a user interface that pulls all of those posts in and, and think of you know how many different versions of a social network there might be, right? There's gonna be some with uh, conservative algorithms, some with liberal algorithms, and that is kind of this future that Jack Dorsey imagines, kind of a, a social network without all the walls and the boundaries. And so that's what Blue Sky is intending to create, a, a technology layer that would essentially allow all of these different networks to contribute their content um, and then let other people build upon that. Well, it certainly is a bit Blue Sky or maybe pie in the sky. Would other companies need to buy in to this vision? Yeah, this only really works if there's a, a bunch of companies that are willing to enable this technology, right? And so there's a belief from Twitter that if they enable it, uh, perhaps they can kind of get the ball rolling, right? People might say, oh, if Twitter's doing this, you know, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, the problem is I can't imagine 
a, a Facebook doing this, for example, right? There's just too much valuable data that they have between Facebook and Instagram that they're not going to want those types of posts available to other developers. And so that's where I see is the big problem here is that it kind of requires buy-in from the industry. And I'm not sure at this stage, certainly at this stage, I don't think we have that. And even once the technology is created, it's going to be a really tough sell. Now, I recently spoke with Vitalik Buterin, who's known as the inventor of Ethereum, who's skeptical about some of Jack Dorsey's plans and also thinks that Ethereum and the blockchain in general pose a real threat to centralized social networks like Facebook and Twitter. Take a listen to what he had to say. I think a lot of these uh, projects wants to uh, actually do this, right? Because I think a lot of them are realizing that being a yeah, kind of centralized focus of power and having control and uh, um, of uh, so much of everyone's data and all of these things, like it's is not just an asset; it can also be a liability as well. I wonder if is there any part of, of Jack Dorsey that's you know working on some of these efforts because he believes that 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 Twitter is not sustainable necessarily in its current form, or that perhaps he's a little scared. I think he believes truly that Twitter has too much power, and I think that was uh, reinforced for him when the company had to make the decision about President Donald Trump's account back in January. I think we saw him at, shortly after that come out and say, hey, I agreed with this decision, but it also made me uncomfortable. You know, we should not be, as, as a company in San Francisco, should not be deciding, um, you know, what is up and what is down. That's why this idea, this, this blue sky idea would work. In theory, Twitter could say, well, we're not going to allow these posts, but another network that's plugged into that same protocol could allow them, right? So it's not up to just one company to remove the posts of a president. And so I think that, you know, the power that Twitter has has a real impact on Jack Dorsey's thinking here. So what are next steps here, Kurt? Well, we uh, heard that Jay was appointed, Jay Graver was appointed the um, leader of this project. Now it's supposed to be an independent project, which means Twitter is funding it, but now it's going to kind of let it fly on its own. Uh, and so they're going to build up a small team um, and really get to work on actually crafting what this technology looks like. I mean, there's a bunch of different ways that they could go. There's some existing technologies out there that they could kind of build upon if they didn't want to start from scratch. But really, it's about now building that team and and kind of, you know, moving away from Twitter and doing this independently. All right. Bloomberg's Kurt Wagner, thanks so much for that update and breaking it down uh, into simple terms that we can try to understand. Um, Kurt, thanks so much. Do not forget, you can catch more of my conversation with Ethereum creator Vitalik Buterin on Bloomberg Studio 1.0, Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 p.m. here on the West Coast. It's a fascinating conversation. And staying with the theme of decentralization, Square has announced it's investing $5 million in renewable crypto mining. The company tweeting, we're committed to driving further adoption and efficiency of renewables within the Bitcoin ecosystem, which is why we've teamed up with Blockstream to launch an open source renewable energy mining project as part of our Bitcoin Clean Energy initiative. For more on the announcement, I want to bring in Blockstream co-founder and CEO Adam Back, who's also the inventor of Hashcash, a proof of work system used in Bitcoin mining. And, and Adam, it's incredible because that was used in Satoshi Nakamoto's original white paper. How long have you been thinking about the energy consumption issue around Bitcoin? When did you start to think this is a problem? Um, I mean, the, I think the uh, energy consumption is best put in context because you know, globally, there's a lot of uh, zero emission power. And because the grid demands are uneven, grids are built to uh, cover the peak capacity. And so they have typically a lot in reserve. And so that tends to get unused. Um, so it's either unused capacity, or in some cases, they have to pay people to shed excess capacity for uh, power projects that spin up and down. So that's that's what the block dream energy announcement is about. And uh, together with Square, we're also building a zero emission uh, kind of pilot, which is fully open source, open sourcing, you know, the financing, the profitability, which people usually keep as proprietary information to kind of prove the thesis that um, the uh, Bitcoin mining can actually improve the profitability 
and therefore help fund building and expanding the zero emission power grid uh, components in the world. So you may recall uh, much earlier in the year, there were some power cuts in Texas, and that's because it's uh, you know built to just in time. So with additional grid uses like this, which can turn on and off, uh, depending on pricing, you can improve the capacity so that you would have less risk of power cuts such as that. Uh, okay, so talk to us about how it works. You say you're leveraging the Blockstream satellite network to connect and operate these mining modules around the world. How, how exactly does this work and, and how will this be used? Uh, yeah, so the, the mining modules, uh, it's like a shipping container, uh, it's sort of in a shipping container format, but it's a mini data center with mining in it. Um, some people may know about the uh, Blockstream satellite, which is a service for broadcasting Bitcoin data around the world. Uh, what's not as widely known and, uh, you know, we're seeing it here is that we have also bi-directional capability sufficient to power a, a mining location. And so we can operate these uh, basically anywhere in the world. Of course, you know, some of them are, uh, we're, we're basically buying power from the power producer. So they don't have to necessarily themselves uh, look to achieve a Bitcoin exposure by doing it. So they buy the equipment and then Blockstream buys the power from them. And so that can be intermittent power from you know, solar, wind, or power that's coming up and down based on grid demand, or very remote power, where there is uh, not much uh, local demand, sort of excess power. Now, you're joining forces with Square to build a solar-powered Bitcoin mining facility in the United States. What can you tell us about this plan? Uh, yeah, so the, the interesting thing there is to kind of fully open source the business model. So actually at Blockstream, we'd had the, you know, been analyzing mining and economics for it for, for quite a while. So we've reached this thesis that mining can uh, sort of cross subsidize or improve the profitability of uh, zero emissions grid infrastructure. And so we saw a, an analysis report by ARC uh, co-authored with Square which reached the same thesis, so we uh, contacted them and got to talking. So we uh, decided between us to actually build, you know, a, a small-sized farm um, and demonstrate it with, you know, open-source dashboard, real-time data, and the financials getting into it. What do you think about Dorsey's plans? What do you think about his plans for the TB ne TBD network in particular? So this is the decentralized uh, Twitter. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, decentralization. I think uh, that it's uh, preferable for kind of internet freedoms that social media companies don't kind of find themselves trapped in the editorial business, right? Meantime, you know, obviously so much has happened since Satoshi's original white paper, and I know you have a connection to that. If Satoshi were here, to here today, what do you think he would think about the whole ecosystem, the community, the frenzy that's built up around his original idea? Well, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, you know, a very large scale system at this point. So you'd have to imagine that Satoshi would be quite impressed with uh, how far it came, um, you know, certainly for participants who have been involved in Bitcoin, uh, you know, in earlier years, 2015, 2013 or before, um, it, it started as a much smaller community hobbyist kind of activity. And, you know, so it's kind of the uh, perpetual September effect, which is about the internet and at any given time, the majority of the users are relatively new because it's growing so fast. You know, so. Bitcoin has a lot of that. So there's a lot of enthusiasm and new users learning. I think it's easier and faster to catch up these days. So many more resources. Bitcoin versus Ethereum. Do you think Ethereum will surpass Bitcoin someday? Um, I think they're very different use cases. So the smart contracting platforms, there are, there are many computing platforms and Blockstream uh, has, has its own uh, version of that, which is we operate, uh, so we provide the technology and that's operated by a number of exchanges around the world. 
for the liquid network, a layer two for smart contracting and asset issuance. Um, and that has its own smart contracting system called Simplicity, which is has formal provable security. So I think one of the things that's tended to let down the very real promise of smart contracts today is the very frequent and very large scale hacks of the systems. So you know, it's only just last week that there was a 600 so what million do you dollar think hack of so what do you think is coming next in crypto that we're not talking about yet? Um, I think the sort of focus on value, um, on solving real use cases, and um, less kind of tokenomics aspects. So, so the security tokens, it's always coming full circle. Uh, so security tokens being an actual registered security where the investor has investor rights. And uh, so with the blockstream mining, as well as enterprise customers, we also offer a financial instrument called the blockstream mining notes. And that is both a security registered in Luxembourg and a, a security token. So an asset you can transfer and sell on to another user or on an exchange in, in the short term on the liquid network, which is you know a layer two of Bitcoin. So being a layer two, there is no new coin involved. It's just using Bitcoin in a similar way that Lightning uses Bitcoin. All right, fascinating. Adam Back, CEO of Blockstream. Thanks so much for joining us and telling us more about your plans. Okay, coming up, ARK Invest CEO Kathy Wood says China's crackdown on its tech companies is stunting innovation. We're gonna bring you our exclusive interview with her next. This is Bloomberg. China has made it a priority to invest in innovation. I'm wondering if something's changing there, though. The last since November, every month, there has been some new form of uh, increased regulatory oversight, crackdown, social engineering, nationalizing the online education companies. It seems like that could uh, uh, could could be contradictory to their desire uh, to become one of the most innovative countries in the world. I've asked staff that we take a pause for now when such listings of shell company issuers associated with China-based operating companies. U.S. SEC Chair Gary Gensler there, who issued his most direct warning yet about the risks of investing in Chinese companies. Let's get some more detail with Bloomberg's Ben Bain. Ben, what can you tell us is driving this? Yeah, you, you, yesterday we heard it really, yeah, in the most, in the bluntest terms yet uh, from the SEC Chair. Essentially, what we've seen, obviously, in, you know, in China over the past few months is, is increasing government crackdown, really, on a range of different sectors in the private industry. But the tension right here that we're seeing right now with securities regulators here in the U.S. really dates well before even the last few months, let alone even going into last year and, and several years. Uh, the issue for the SEC is that Chinese audit firms don't allow U.S. inspectors to review Chinese companies' financial audits, for one. And for two, the SEC is raising the point that the way Chinese companies list here in the United States, on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ primarily, is they set up shell companies in places like the Cayman Islands. This is because there's restrictions from Beijing in terms of foreign investment into the actual Chinese operating companies. So essentially, when an American investor is buying a share here in New York, they're actually buying a share in a shell company. And what the SEC chair is saying is the disclosure around that hasn't been sufficient. Essentially, Americans, American investors don't realize they're not actually buying a stake in a Chinese company. They're buying a stake in um, one of these offshore companies. And, 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 and what we're, we're hearing, particularly over the last month or so from the SEC, is that IPOs from these firms are not going to go forward until more information is disclosed, until it's clearer to investors what the risks are. And, uh, and, and basically, that's kind of where we are right now. How is China reacting to this at this point? When the SEC came out late last month, when you know SEC Chair Gensler came out, he's only been in there about three or four months. It was really his 
most direct statement at that point, uh, you know, about this issue, which has really festered, you know, kind of over the U.S.-China relationship for years. He basically came out and said, look, we need more disclosures or these IPOs are not going to go forward. And China came back and said, Chinese securities regulators said, well, we want to have a dialogue. We want to figure out, um, you know, how we can kind of work through that. We don't have any indication that that dialogue has actually occurred, and we don't also know whether it's likely to yield any kind of fruits in the near term. Um, this has kind of been going, as I mentioned, for, for literally almost two decades. Um, a lot of this dates back to a 2002 law here in the United States that really changed how the accounting and audit industry worked. And these U.S. inspectors have been supposed to, has, have been supposed to have access to these audits literally almost for two decades, and it hasn't happened yet. So we don't know how quickly this is going to change, um, but for right now, things are frozen. All right. Bloomberg's Ben Bain, thanks so much for that update. Obviously, uh, we're going to continue to follow this back and forth. Meantime, ARK Investment Management CEO Kathy Wood, who has for months been pairing holdings tied to Chinese tech giants, says the country that's focused on innovation seems to be in a state of retreat. Wood sees government crackdowns hindering China's efforts to be a world leader in technology. She spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Shanali Basik. Take a listen. China has made it a priority to invest in innovation. And if you listen to Elon Musk, he, he, he'll tell you, gosh, I go to any city in China, any major city, and talk to the, the mayor of that city, he's going to be expert in technology. A lot of them have engineering degrees, computer science, and so forth. So the whole country is focused on uh, becoming number one in innovation. Um, I'm wondering if something's changing there, though. The last since November, every month there has been some new form of uh, increased regulatory oversight, crackdown, social engineering, nationalizing the online education companies, and I think they're referring to the divide between uh, more wealthy and lower income uh, people. Uh, they're definitely responding to that. But they're also clamping down. They seem to be retreating, in a sense, when it comes to allowing any kind of data uh, to come out of the country. So it seems uh, it seems like that could uh, uh, could could be contradictory to their desire uh, to become one of the most innovative countries in the world. As an investor, I know you don't have a huge China presence right now, but would you avoid China or pull out of China even more given what's going on? Well, they're sending a strong message. And it, it, you know when they uh, use expressions as they did with the online education uh, companies, they, they said uh, uh, that it had been hijacked by capital. Uh, that sounds uh, that sounds a little rough on capital, and uh, so I think the valuation of the market is going to stay down until for, for a long time uh, uh, until they become more inviting to foreign capital again, uh, and maybe want to integrate a little bit more into the world than they seem to right now. Uh, we do own in some of our more specialized funds. Uh, some Chinese stocks have tried to stay away from uh, uh, those that uh, are uh, privy to a lot of private information and are online, um, although you can't stay away from all of them. Uh, but we have minimized our positions significantly. And in our flagship fund, uh, I, I don't, we, we don't ha own any more Chinese stocks. Kathy Wood there of ARK Invest. You can catch that full interview at Bloomberg.com. Plenty more still ahead as we had to break. Palantir Technologies up more than 230% since going public last year. The company is saying it's preparing for another black swan event and is stockpiling gold bars. Palantir spent $50.7 million on the precious metal this month. It's also inviting customers to pay for its data analysis software in gold. Palantir had previously stated it would accept Bitcoin as a form of payment. This is Bloomberg. For the first time, Twitter will allow users to report misinformation to the company. But Twitter says the expanded ability to flag tweets won't necessarily lead 
to more fact-checking or labels on problematic posts. Instead, Twitter will use the reports to study misinformation on the platform and identify problem areas to focus on. A test of the operation is being trialed in the United States, Australia, and South Korea. A lawsuit has been filed against the largest SPAC ever to hit the market. The suit claims that billionaire Bill Ackman's Pershing Square is operating illegally as an investment company. Less than a month ago, the blank check company abandoned plans for a deal with Universal Music Group. Ackman says the suit is totally without merit. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in tomorrow when we'll be joined by Joanne Feeney from Advisors Capital Management to break down NVIDIA results and talk about all things chips. Plus, we're going to speak with Will Marshall, CEO of the global satellite imaging, imaging company Planet. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.